All right, newly minted DCFS director, Heidi Miller, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thank you, Paul. You're about a month and a half in now to your ten tenure as the uh, DCFS director. Yes. What has been the focal point going uh, in the, just the first month here? Well, that's a great question. Um, coming in as a new director, there's kind of operational things you focus on and then sort of the mission and the vision, the principle. Um, so right off the bat, you know, I'm coming in to understand how is this agency functioning? Uh, what do we do? What are, you know, who are the folks in the, the uh, primary positions? Um, and as a new director, I think it's really critical to figure out like what's going well? What are the things I wanna put my elbows out and protect and sort of lift up and make sure I don't uh, screw with too much? Uh, I think, you know, philosophically as I come in, I'm really looking at kind of three things right off the bat. Um, the first is kind of identifying that we have had this upward trajectory in reports, in investigations, in kind of kids coming into care over the past five years. And so really thinking about how do we focus on prevention? How do we focus on, you know, right-sizing the agency so that we can use scarce resources to really solve a lot of the things that we have before us? I think the second thing I'm really thinking about is how do we make sure that we do everything we can to keep kids safely at home um, and make sure that you know kids are able to remain with family uh, with extended family in communities um, with all of those sort of natural connections that are going to follow them throughout their lives and really help them grow into adults into human beings um, i think the third thing you know i'm really thinking about is how do we make sure that we are embedding this agency with the value of caring for kids like they are our own kids. And you know what I mean by that is especially in the in, in the realm of you know kids who have really specialized needs are kids who who need sort of a high level of of care, making sure that we have the nurturing, individualized, um, specialized resources and care that they need to be successful, um, to meet their individual needs and to ultimately be stable so they can kind of transition either into a home setting or into adulthood. You said you really want to protect the things that DCFS has been doing to improve over the past few years, but there are a lot of areas that have come under a lot of scrutiny with the department, especially when we're talking about areas like uh, uh, children staying in certain facilities for, for longer than they were originally supposed to. Uh, there's a lack of spots for these children to be to find homes with once they're in DCFS care and trying to exit that care. I wonder when you're coming into a position like this, when you were you know, going through that interviewing process for the job, was part of that you coming to the table with ideas that you had to maybe fix some of these some of these areas that the department has struggled with for years now? Well, I'm really glad you asked me that question because honestly, part of the reason that I came to DCFS was because I wanted to be part of the solution for kids who need appropriate, safe, nurturing places to stay that meet their individual needs. Um, I have a lot of experience at DJJ working with a very traumatized, high needs, you know, high complexity population. Those are the kids that over the past seven years I have loved and taken care of. Um, and so I bring that sort of experience and understanding of kind of all of the wraparound services, kind of all the care and support that kids who have really complex, you know, behavioral health needs, kids who have substance use treatment disorders, kids on the autistic spectrum, um, the sorts of things that those kids might need to be successful. Um, and so, you know, coming in, I'm bringing that experience um, and that lens. Uh, and I think, you know, it is one of my core priorities. You know, within this first year as I'm coming in, I really want to make sure that we have a plan in place that is going to, to sort of make, you know, make sure that kids have a safe, stable, appropriate place to live and that their needs are met um, regardless of what those needs are. And we're not just talking about, you know, residential placements because 
a lot of kids with really complex needs want to be in a home setting too. And so we're also talking about specialized treatment foster care. We're also talking about evidence-based intensive wraparound services in communities that will let kids remain at home even though they have a lot of behavioral health needs and challenges. How do you go about creating those services in areas of the state that really don't have them? There's that vacuum mm -hmm, there in mm -hmm. those areas. Well, that's a really great question, and I'm glad you acknowledge that, because there are parts of our state that are really resource starved, where there's a lot of service gaps. And so it really has to be something that is data driven. We have to look at, you know, where are their needs around the state? Um, what are we seeing? based on our own work and then we need to use our dollars wisely to you know invest in the type of services that really are needed so for example um, I've met with a lot of judges around the state you know and this was also in my role as director of DJJ and one of the top things that I've heard from the court system is there aren't enough mental health resources and that seems to be a refrain especially in rural communities um, in, in southern communities, there just aren't sort of good mental health treatment resources. So, you know, making sure that we have placements that kids can go to, like, like Hoylton, which serves, you know, the southern region that provides really good, like, wraparound services for kids. Those are the sorts of things we want to make sure we're investing in. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're investing not just in, like, sort of the services that meet a community's needs, but in the type of sort of culturally competent services that really, like, understand where a family, where a young person is coming from and address their needs in a way that affirms their identity. So when going about all this, you talked about the data-driven approach and, and finding where those resources need to go. But then the, the other part is making sure the resources get there. And yes. I know part of, there's been a big hiring push for DCFS yes. lately, but the department has had its struggles over the years and that's led to, you know, I, 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 there were people wondering, it, frankly, who would want your job now, yes. the DCFS director job. Yes. So I wonder, talking about that public image perspective of the agency and trying to turn that around uh -huh. and then make sure people get in and you are able to find people for those jobs. Right. How is that process working right, right. and how do you go forward with that? Well, you know, you mentioned the hiring push um, and I, I do have to say coming in as a new director, I'm really grateful to former Director Smith um, and some of the work that already has been happening there because I'm coming in um, to an agency that is in a much better place than it was a few years ago in terms of hiring and staffing. Actually, in FY24, um, as of FY24, we have 23% more frontline staff than we did just in FY20. And, you know, as you alluded to, you cannot do good work without enough people without the people to actually do the caring, um, to work with kids, to work with families. So it is a big push of ours. And as we go forward into this next fiscal year, we are actually asking for a headcount increase to replenish our ranks to a, a level that we haven't had in 20 years, to, to get up to 4,000 employees, um, to really replenish our frontline ranks so that we have enough people to do the work and to do the work well. I think you're right. What you said is so right on that, you know, people are drawn to come into your agency and to work for you if they believe in your vision and if they believe in your mission um, and they're, they're drawn to success. So one of the things that is important to me, especially in my first six month, months in this role, is to really set forward a vision and to work with my team to set forward a mission and a, and a set of values that drive our work that people can look at and say, I want to be a part of that. I want to join that. Especially in the aftermath of the news that Mark Smith was going to be stepping down from the position, we heard from a lot of Republican lawmakers especially talking about how they wanted to see a overhaul of this agency. And it, they were saying it's time to really start from scratch on this kind of department. Now, obviously, you've been talking about building from within inside the already structured system. But I, I wonder, in your tenure, what do you... How are you expecting to approach those kinds of conversations when we're talking about maybe dramatic changes to how DCFS operates in the state? And if there's any that maybe you have an idea of, of maybe something that maybe a significant change that could be coming. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it really starts with listening. So I've really appreciated so far 
the ability to sit down with legislators. You know, I've I've had breakfast, I've had, you know, lunch, I've had dinner, I've I've sat in meetings with both legislators who have been supporters and legislators who have been very vocal critics. I've, you know, met with frontline staff, I've been meeting with judges. I'm really trying to sort of just signal to everybody this door is open and I want to hear from people I want to hear what folks think is working what people think isn't working um, what other folks think needs to be changed because the reality is DCFS is a part of the child welfare system we don't act alone in this system the child welfare system in Illinois involves this agency it involves the courts it involves you know public guardian it involves community providers advocates, you know, kids and families. And I think it would be unwise to sort of come in, you know, guns a blazing and say, I alone am going to come up with the solution to all of the problems in this agency. For me, it really is starting with listening and talking to people and gathering, you know, feedback about what has been working, what hasn't, and together collaborating on, you know, what do our, what are, what is our path forward? There was a hearing a few weeks back where I believe you testified in the hearing where one of the numbers that stood out to me was this, uh, I believe it was 4% of uh, children that DCFS, of cases that DCFS looks into, 4% uh, of the children in those cases are actually taken into state care. And I wonder with that, I, I wanted some additional context, I guess, to that number, because is that a, it seemed low, I guess, when we're talking about, you know, DCFS, you know, a case significant enough for them to look into it. Only 4% of those kids going into state care. Is that something that the department looks at and says, maybe that needs to be improved? Or is that a better thing that, you know, 96% are deemed able to stay in their homes? Uh -huh. That is a really wonderful question. And I'm really glad you asked it because it is, it's a really complicated question. Um, you know, the thing about taking kids into care is, you know, I think for some people, they sort of view that as a low risk option. They view that as, you know, this is the solution um, to every problem. And the reality is, whenever you remove a child from the only home that that child has ever known, that is a known trauma. That is an intense trauma for that child. And you are basically at that moment making a decision that's gonna follow that child for the rest of their life. It is also a huge trauma on a family. Um, and it, you're, you're basically taking the power of the state and you're saying, you know, we're gonna determine who gets to have this right to raise a, a child and we're gonna determine like who that child gets to be for the rest of their life. And so for us, it really is a success. The more that we can find a way for a child to be home safely, the better it is for that child, the better it is for that family. And honestly, you know, we know that those strong supported families are the cornerstone of thriving communities. So it's good for the community too. I think, you know, the question for us is, you know, we have a protocol. There are a lot of like federal and state mandates that govern first when we have to investigate a case, but also you know, what criteria need to be met in order for us to remove a child from the home. And there are civil rights protections there. So we always have to make sure that we're being mindful of that. But for us, whenever we can, we want to find ways to support a family and make that family strong and safe so that a child can remain at home with you know, parents, with extended family members in their community with people who know them and love them and kind of form the basis of all the connections that we all need to grow and thrive and become healthy, productive adults. In that same vein of questioning, it, does there need to be a greater focus on the following up after that initial investigation? Because obviously we've seen some cases that have gotten very high profile mm -hmm. in that regard where yeah. DCFS had stepped in at some point but didn't and maybe didn't intervene in, in hindsight 2020 in a lot of those cases but i wonder is there does there need to be a greater focus on follow-up steps after those initial that initial contact is made between the state and and a family in these questions that is a really great question and i you know six weeks in um i i do think that we have a solution in the works that is really going to 
drive good case practice as we go forward, and that's something called the SAFE model. Um, it's something that, again, I have to give credit to Director Smith and his team for identifying as part of the path forward for DCFS. Um, but what it is is an evidence-based model that has been successful in, uh, I think, more than 20 jurisdictions across the country. And it really provides this guide towards decision-making and case management for our frontline workers. So first, it helps guide them through that. You know, if you think about it, if you put yourself in the shoes of a, a worker who's going into a home in the middle of the night, maybe investigating, you know, these folks that they've never met and having to make a split second decision about something that could impact that family and child for the rest of their lives. We as, you know, leaders of the agency better be equipping them with all the tools we can to make those decisions well. And the SAFE model does that. But in addition, it provides sort of a guide for our caseworkers to follow as they do the follow-up, as they do the case management, both to create sort of concrete markers that families can meet in order for us to determine this is a safe home for a child to return to, or you know, markers that say it is not safe yet and we need to keep a child in our care until we can continue to work with that family and continue to find the supports that will make the family safe. Um, so it is, the SAFE model is something that we are starting the rollout of this summer in, in June of 2024, and I'm really excited about it. I feel like as the new director coming in, I get to be part of something that, you know, started before me, but is really going to strengthen our work and, you know, really push us to a place of excellence as we move forward. There has been... In, in these problems that have that DCFS has seen have stretched back decades at this point. A lot of them have. We've we've seen reports over just the past 12 years, but there was also consent decrees issued back in the, I believe, the 90s on on kind of levels that DCFS needs to meet on certain on certain criteria. And I wonder when you're coming into a position like this, the status of the department right now compared to where you know maybe those decrees say it needs to be, or where the conversation is about how well the state needs to be doing in these certain areas. How do you view reaching those levels? Is this, is this going to be slow incremental change when we're talking about filling these positions, creating these new spots for children to go to, or is this something that the state can take real actionable steps immediately to make significant changes in how this department operates? Well, the, the answer is a bit of both. Uh, and coming into this role, I actually have experience coming into compliance with consent decrees. Uh, when I was at DJJ, when I first started, we were under two federal consent decrees. By the time I left, we had successfully terminated one of them, and we were within just a few, really a few months of coming into success, successfully coming into compliance with the second. Um, so I have experience moving a state agency into compliance with the consent decree, and I, I understand what that takes. I will say I have never experienced that happening overnight. <laughs> it does take time, it takes work, it takes prioritization and focus because you can't run at everything all at once. But what I found in my experience is that, you know, it is a mix of some bold actions, things like implementing the SAFE model that you do department-wide, uh, things like our planned rollout of Illinois Connect that is going to sort of bring us all of our technology into the 21st century and help us sort of meet deadlines, um, meet criteria, meet notifications really timely and automatically and allow our caseworkers to spend more time, you know, doing what they're meant to do, which is work with kids and families instead of filling out paperwork. Um, so there are those kind of bold things. And then there is the incremental change. There is, you know, day by day, rolling up your sleeves, you know, sort of quality control, following up week after week, setting targets, hitting those targets, setting a new target, hitting that target, and moving forward that way. And you know, what, in my experience, what I found is that sort of both things are necessary. Um, but I have had a lot of success in doing that. And I, I do feel hopeful about us being able to sort of move forward in this consent decree and start to make progress. All right. Uh, before I finish up here, I have one more question. We've kind of alluded to it a couple of times, but in when the search for the new director for this department started, there was a lot of talk about, OK, you got to find somebody who wants the job in that particular area. You talked about what your experience in DJJ 
helps you bring to the table for this position, but I wonder, why did you want this job? <laughs> it's a very highly scrutinized position. I mean, honestly, what about this job made you want to step into this role that has been in the spotlight and has had so much turnover over just the past decade? I will be honest with you. I was scared to take this job. I, I think that anybody who is smart and competent enough to take this job would be scared of this job. Um, you know, I'm part, a member of the public too. I've seen the media. You know, I see what happens to the directors in this role. I mean, I've experienced it somewhat because I've been the director of a state agency for seven years. Um, but really for me, and I, I won't lie, I, I reached out to trusted colleagues and mentors and said, is this crazy? Should I do this? And they all said, it is crazy, and yes, you should do it. <laughs> um, but for me, it really is a life's mission. I have spent my entire life, you know, even before career, even when I was in high school, devoted to caring for kids. And, you know, as an adult in my career, my whole career has been devoted to working with kids and families. It's really all I've ever wanted to do. And in my role at DJJ, I found that almost all of the kids I worked with had touched the DCFS system. And I heard their stories. And I felt like the opportunity to move farther upstream and sort of help impact kids and families and help get them what they need before they get to the point of you know the, coming into the correctional system was so appealing the opportunity to sort of look at especially you know young women who are struggling you know new parents and finding ways to wrap around them and support them so that they can s successfully raise their own kids that's so appealing um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in this state and in this agency, but I guess I felt like I had learned so much running a different state agency for seven years that I really wanted to be able to take those learnings and all that experience and apply it to, to help even more kids um, and help even more families get what they needed early on so that they don't have to sort of cycle through these really sort of traumatic experiences and, and traumatic systems. All right, well, DCFS Director Heidi Miller, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. When we come back, we take a look at a pilot program from the state that helped food insecure areas across the state get access to groceries and why there may be a problem continuing that program going forward.